Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Bienvenidos. Antes de dar inicio a este webinar, nos gustaría brindar algunas indicaciones técnicas sobre el desarrollo de esta actividad. Este webinar tendrá dos canales de audio para la comodidad de todos sus participantes. Habrá un canal de audio original en el que podrán escuchar parte de la sesión en español y la presentación de nuestra expositora en inglés. Por otro lado, hay disponible otro canal donde encontrarán una interpretación simultánea de inglés a español durante la intervención de nuestra expositora. En pantalla podrán ir viendo eh, las explicaciones eh, técnicas de este tema. Para seleccionar el canal de audio de su preferencia, en la barra superior debe entrar a la opción más o more, ya sea en inglés o español. Luego, lenguaje y habla, language and speech y luego interpretación del lenguaje. Allí podrá seleccionar el canal de audio de su preferencia. Si está ingresando desde su móvil, encontrará estas mismas opciones en la parte inferior de su pantalla de Teams. Por otro lado, sobre las preguntas y respuestas durante la intervención de la expositora, podrán enviar sus preguntas en el espacio designado de preguntas y respuestas que hemos designado para ello. Este espacio se encuentra en el menú superior, PIR o Q&A. Aquí podrán dejar sus preguntas. Recuerde que para poder responder a sus preguntas o dudas, deberá dejar su consulta solo en este espacio. Nuestra expositora hará el máximo esfuerzo para responder a todas las preguntas en el tiempo otorgado para ello. Esta información técnica de escucha y participación estará disponible para todos en el chat para su consulta. Sin más preámbulos, agradecemos a todos su presencia en este evento denominado Espacio de Preguntas y Respuestas para el Reglamento de la Unión Europea sobre Productos Libres de Deforestación EUDR, evento que busca ser un espacio para que el sector agrícola se prepare para la debida diligencia Reglamento de la Unión Europea. Este evento responde a la iniciativa conjunta del portafolio Biodiversidad y Negocios y el proyecto Iniciativa de Cadenas de Valor Sostenibles, implementado por la Cooperación Alemana para el Desarrollo GIZ, por encargo del Ministerio Federal Alemán de Cooperación Económica y Desarrollo BMZ. Hoy nos acompañan el señor Jorge Asturias, asesor técnico de la Cooperación Alemana para el Desarrollo GIZ, en representación de la señora Svenja Paulino, directora de Portafolio Biodiversidad y Negocios en Centroamérica y República Dominicana. El señor Moisés Mérida, director de Partnership for Development de la Asociación Guatemalteca de Exportadores a Export. Y el señor Michael Layton, técnico en comunicación para el programa Biodiversidad y Negocios en Centroamérica y República Dominicana. Bienvenidos, gracias por estar aquí. Aprovechamos para agradecer a Export por el apoyo brindado en los últimos meses para identificar alianzas y áreas de trabajo en conjunto entre los sectores que formarán parte de la nueva legislación Arte de la nueva legislación. EUDR y que también están en busca de aumentar su competitividad por medio de innovación en procesos de trazabilidad digital. Este es el primer encuentro de la mesa de diálogo sectorial creada por varios, varios actores del sector exportador de Guatemala el pasado mes de septiembre en el taller Trazabilidad Digital y Cero Deforestación. Gracias a los representantes de los sectores por su asistencia a esta primera sesión de intercambio. A continuación, el señor Jorge Asturias, asesor técnico de la Cooperación Alemana para el Desarrollo GIZ, en representación de la señora Svenja Paulino, directora del Portafolio Biodiversidad y Negocios en Centroamérica y República Dominicana, nos dará unas palabras de bienvenida. Adelante. Ya, Gabriela. Buenos días a todos y a todas. En nombre de la Cooperación Alemana GIZ y de nuestra directora, la señora Esbenia Paulino, directora del Portafolio de Biodiversidad y Negocios, 
Le damos la más cordial bienvenida a esta primera sesión y ojalá de muchas sesiones que estaremos realizando conjuntamente con ustedes para poder comprender aún mejor el nuevo reglamento eh, de la Unión Europea sobre productos libres de deforestación, que como todos sabemos, inicialmente está cubriendo seis productos básicos, ganado, madera, aceite de palma, soya, café y cacao. Eh, la mayoría de estos productos relevantes para la economía de nuestro país, Guatemala, eh, y sin embargo, creemos que en los próximos años pueden ingresar nuevos productos. De esta manera, eh, con esta primera sesión, estamos atendiendo eh, el compromiso que hemos asumido en el primer taller, donde validamos con muchos de ustedes una propuesta de cofinanciamiento con la Unión Europea y el gobierno alemán, para implementar un proyecto en Guatemala eh, que pueda atender esta temática y donde estaremos cubriendo inicialmente cuatro productos de estos que están eh, involucrados en la, eh, en la nueva reglamentación, que es café, cacao, aceite de palma y azúcar. Eh, esperamos que esta sesión sea de provecho para todos y agradecemos a nuestra colega en la sede central GIZ en Alemania, la señora Francisca Rau, por el tiempo que nos dedica y por compartir con nosotros sus conocimientos sobre esta temática para poder contribuir a nuestro entendimiento sobre la regulación y su alcance. Reiteramos también nuestro agradecimiento a Hexport y a los socios con los que hemos venido trabajando, como Grepalma, Anacafé, Anacacao, eh, Asadwa, el Ministerio de Ambiente, el Ministerio de Economía, que se han sumado a esta iniciativa y que estaremos implementando eh, el próximo año. Bienvenidos y muchas gracias por su presencia. Muchas gracias, señor Jorge. A continuación, palabras por parte del señor Moisés Mérida, director de Partnership for Development de la Asociación Guatemalteca de Exportadores a Export. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Gabriela. Buenos días a todos y todas. Y muchísimas gracias a GIZ por la eh, convocatoria y la invitación para este webinar eh, sobre el reglamento de la Unión Europea para productos libres de deforestación. Eh, yo quisiera resaltar dos temas, eh, dando la bienvenida a todos y todas eh, los participantes de, esta, de este webinar. Primero, la, la relevancia que bien nos decía Jorge que tiene estas regulaciones de, que se dan en el marco del, de, del Pacto Verde de la Unión Europea para las exportaciones de Guatemala hacia, hacia ese mercado. Es una realidad eh, que los mercados, los consumidores están cada vez poniéndole más atención a los temas de sostenibilidad y eso, eh, para quienes estamos interesados en, en, en explorar el mercado europeo, es cada vez más relevante y eh, pues muy, muy claro lo que, lo que se tiene que, que hacer para poder cumplir y poder eh, permanecer eh, o, o eh, aprovechar ese mercado. Eh, y eh, el otro eh, tema, eh, bueno, y eso pues me, me, me alegra poder estar eh, colaborando en este caso con GIZ para poder avanzar esa agenda que ayudará a las empresas a cumplir esas nuevas regulaciones y a poder seguir exportando a la Unión Europea. Y el segundo punto es precisamente eso, la, el valor que tienen las alianzas. Y en este caso nosotros estamos muy contentos de, de formar parte de esta alianza con GIZ para llevar a cabo esta nueva iniciativa que apoyará a la Unión Europea para permitir eh, esos apoyos a las empresas y, y mejorar ese cumplimiento. Así que eh, en ambos sentidos, eh, simplemente reiterar el compromiso de Agexport para tanto lo que esté en nuestras posibilidades y competencias hacer para apoyar a las empresas. Nosotros tenemos representados en nuestra asociación las, los sectores de café, de cacao, de madera, eh, y de, de caucho, que sabemos que también entra en la, en la regulación. Eh, eh, y, y por ende, pues mucho interés de nuestra parte para ser ese facilitador con nuestras empresas y de hecho sea de paso con cualquier otra que quiera, que quiera participar en la cadena de exportación. Eh, y eh, pues eh, en la mejor disposición de, col de colaborar y de contribuir tanto en esta actividad como en el proyecto que se viene. Así que muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, eh, señor Moisés. 
Ahora extendemos la palabra al señor Michael Layton, técnico en comunicación para el programa Biodiversidad y Negocios en Centroamérica y República Dominicana. Adelante. Muchísimas gracias, María Gabriela. Muchísimas gracias también a las palabras del señor Moisés y el señor Jorge. Tal como mencionaba María Gabriela, yo soy asesor técnico en comunicación para GIZ y voy a encargarme de la moderación a partir de este momento. Así que le agradecemos a todos y todas por estar presentes el día de hoy. Recuerden, la temática que nos compete hoy es la nueva legislación de la Unión Europea. Y por eso, para poder ponernos en contexto sobre nuestro diálogo, hemos invitado a una de las técnicas de la GIZ de Alemania, que ha formado parte de los equipos que analizan el desarrollo de esta nueva legislación. Para conocer más entonces sobre este tema, recibimos de forma virtual a parte del equipo del proyecto de iniciativa de cadenas agrícolas sostenibles INA. Recibimos a la señora Francisca Rao, experta en esta temática. Pero antes, es importante recordarles que este evento no contiene ninguna opinión o evaluación oficial del reglamento y tampoco refleja las opiniones de la Unión Europea o del Gobierno Federal de Alemania. Se ha elaborado sobre la base de una evaluación de la GIZ y también de INA para facilitar el debate y no debe utilizarse como asesoramiento jurídico sobre este reglamento. Así que ahora sí, vamos a dar inicio con la presentación de Francisca y recuerden que para eso también Gabriela hizo esta introducción técnica que nosotros estamos teniendo traducción simultánea. Así que si a alguno todavía no le ha quedado claro cómo se realiza esta traducción, cómo pueden aprovechar para escuchar a Francisca en español o en inglés, pueden hacer sus consultas a través del chat y nosotros con gusto los vamos a asesorar para que puedan experimentar esta presentación de la mejor manera posible. Así que muchísimas gracias a todos y todas. Y ahora sí, Francisca, adelante, la escuchamos. Buenos días. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very sorry for not speaking Spanish and... Uh, the more I'm grateful to my colleagues for um, providing translation here. Uh, I'm Francisca Rao. I'm working for GIZ in the Initiative for Sustainable Agricultural Supply Chains, short INA, uh, in GIZ headquarters. I'm working on commodity driven deforestation for 10 years and um, advise also BMZ a bit on this legislative process on the EU regulation deforestation free products. So I'm honored that today I might present this important regulation to stakeholders in Guatemala. And please allow me one second to share my presentation with you. Uh, you should see it in a second. I think it's loading. I hope everybody can see it. Otherwise, you would certainly correct me. Um, maybe two brief disclaimers in advance. Um, first of all, um, I do not speak on behalf of the EU and I also do not speak on behalf of Germany. I'm here as GIZ technical advisor providing like a um, technical presentation on the content of the EUDR. And I'm very curious also about your questions later on. And I uh, also do not provide legal advice, of course. Um, and the second disclaimer is that it's winter time in Germany and I have a bit of a cold. So please forgive me if I have to turn to my water glass for a second, etc. So with that, um, I would like to dive a bit into the regulation. Mm -hmm. The regulation on deforestation free products called shortly UDR. Oh, that was too quick. Apologies. So here you can um, see the timeline. Uh, this regulation did not come overnight. It's prepared through quite a long process. Um, you might know that many companies already committed to zero deforestation supply, free supply chains in since 2010, so in the last 13 years. And the European Commission published its very first study on the deforestation footprint of the European Union already in 2013 where they assess their deforestation footprint. Um, when 2020 came closer, the target year for many of the zero deforestation commitments of companies, the commission announced in July 2019 that 
they will assess if it needs a regulatory framework to address deforestation and supply chains, simply because it was pretty clear that most companies would not achieve their objectives. The deforestation rate was still very high, so they recognized that um, voluntary action alone might not be sufficient to achieve this international objective of halting deforestation, and therefore they um, announced that they will assess legislative measures. They, will de they then published two years ago, in November 21, the legislative proposal by the European Commission for this regulation on deforestation-free products. It then went into the legislative process and went through it with actually quite some speed. It was adopted by the European Parliament in April this year and by the Council of EU Member States in May this year and has entered into force end of June 23. So at the moment, we are now in this um, transition phase um, where uh, companies and everybody can get prepared and it will apply to bigger companies up from end of 24 and to small and micro enterprises in the EU up from mid 25. Um, very importantly, there are also some reviews that will take place already partly in mid next year and then mid 25. So this is a bit the timeline of the regulation where we come from. And with that, I would like to dive deeper into the regulation itself. Its objective is to minimize the EU contribution to deforestation and forest degradation, and thereby also to minimize the EU's contribution to climate change and biodiversity loss, so to international um, joint objectives. It's very important that this regulation applies only to a few products. These are coffee, cocoa, natural rubber, palm oil, soy, cattle, and um, timber products, as well as to certain derived products. For example, it also applies to um, um, palm oil derivatives or chocolate or, for example, wooden chairs. If you would like to know to which product it applies specifically, then please look into Annex 1. It lists the HS codes, so the trade codes of all relevant products that are covered by the regulation. Very importantly, this regulation applies to all products that are placed on the EU market. This wording might sound a bit weird in first place, but placing on the EU market means it applies to products that are imported to the EU and to products that are produced within the EU and then traded there. And it also applies to products, relevant products that are exported from the EU. This means products from inside and outside the EU are treated equally. There's no differentiation between the two of them. And I can assure you that also in particular European forestry owners and cattle ranchers are also strongly affected by this regulation. With that, um, maybe a bit more in the details. You might know already that this regulation is based on a concept of deforest uh, due diligence. Um, and you might know that due diligence is a concept that um, supports company with addressing deforestation and sustainability risks in their supply chains by, for example, formulating policies to um, address the sustainability risk, to identify relevant measures to prevent and address a risk, and then to monitor effectiveness and report on it. This regulation is also based on this concept, but it goes a bit beyond by um, obliging companies to ensure through due diligence that products meet certain criteria. So in the future, these relevant products that I just mentioned can only be priced on the EU market if they are produced without deforestation, if they are produced legally, and if they are covered by a so-called due diligence statement. Now the devil is always in the detail. No deforestation means that the product was play, uh, produced on land where no deforestation took place after 2020, meaning no conversion of forest as defined by FAO. And uh, very importantly, for example, plantations of palm oil and rubber and also agroforestry are considered agricultural land. So according to the regulation, you cannot convert, for example, an FAO forest into agroforestry after 2020. 
Um, the Commission will also uh, publish some guidelines on what this term agricultural use means in specific in the first half year of 24. And very important is that this so-called cut-off date of 2020, after which deforestation is considered as deforestation in the context of this regulation, is inspired by and in line with SDG 15, where the international community had committed to hold deforestation by 2020. That's where it's based from. So this definition of deforestation free applies to all relevant products. Whereas the definition of um, no degradation only applies to timber products. And it says that after end of 2020, timber products cannot be harvested from land where the conversion of primary forests or naturally regenerating forests into plantation forests took place or into so-called other wooded land. That's also an FAO category. And also where no con conversion of primary forests into planted forest took place. So these are the criteria on deforestation free. Then importantly, and also because it's also inspired by the EU timber regulation, the EU TR, with which some of you might be familiar. It of course also asks that companies must only place products on the EU market that are produced in accordance with relevant legislation of the country of production. And there the commission defines or the regulation defines eight categories. They range from land use rights over environmental protection to forest relevant regulations, also on forest management and biodiversity conservation if they are related to wood harvesting. It also applies to third parties rights, to labor rights, to international human rights protected by international law if they are ratified in a country of production. Also to the principle of free prior and informed consent and it also includes relevance, relevant tax, anti-corruption, trade and customs regulation. So these part, sorts of regulation in the country of production must be respected by a company if they want to place the product on the EU market. And then finally, the product can only be placed on the EU market if the uh, company submits the so-called due diligence statement. With this statement, the company confirms that it has conducted due diligence, that it has found no or only a maximum negligible risk of non-compliance, so of deforestation illegality, and it must submit thereby the geolocations of all plots of land of production of this cargo they want to bring on the EU market. That's very important. I will go into the details on this in a second. So with that, I will look more into the company obligations. So every company that brings a relevant product on the EU market for the very first time must fulfill the entire due diligence. This is a three-step process that I will explain in a minute. And here it does not matter how big the company is. Always the, big, the first company that places the product on the EU market and that is established in the EU. It's always the first company that is established in the EU that will be responsible for the due diligence obligation. In addition, so-called traders, and this is now an unusual sense of the term traders, traders are all companies that trade with a relevant product that is already placed on the EU market. So this is are not conventional agricultural traders like, like Kage or whatever, but these are all companies that trade with a product that is already on the EU market, so also a consumer goods manufacturer, like for example, Nestle could be a, a trader. They also have fulfilled due diligence obligations. There are only some ex exemptions when other companies have fulfilled that already, but I think that's not really relevant here because it's then really for um, EU internal companies only relevant. The only exemption applies to small trading companies. They only have to document from whom they have bought the product and to whom they are selling the product. And like all other companies, they also have to inform common authorities if they have information about potential non-compliances with this regulation. So you see this regulation places obligations on companies those companies that place the product for the very first time on the EU market and that are established in the EU. It does not put any direct obligations, for example, on, on smallholders who will most likely not directly place the product in the EU market because there are several companies in between. 
So this is this three or four step due diligence procedure. In first place, companies have to collect relevant data and information. Secondly, based on this data collection, they have to assess the potential risk of non-compliances. And if they come to the conclusion based on this that there is no risk or only a negligible risk, then they can file their due diligence statement and put a product on the EU market. If based on this they come to the conclusion that there is a risk of deforestation and illegality, then they can undertake so-called risk mitigation measures. Um, and if based on these risk mitigation measures they come to the conclusion that there is now a only negligible risk, then they can um, put the product on the EU market. If, however, they come to the conclusion that they cannot minimize the risk to a negligible level, then the product cannot be placed on the EU market. That's the consequence. And now what does this mean in detail? In first place, as I said, companies have to collect relevant information. This is, for example, the name of the product, the quantity, also the geolocations of all plots of land of production. This is definitely a key requirement. So the company must know from which plots of land this product comes from and must collect the geolocations of all relevant plots of land. If these plots of land have more than four hectares, the company must provide so-called polygons. This means sufficient geo-coordinates to describe the shape of the plot of land or of the field. If it has less than four hectares, simply one point coordinate is enough. And in addition, they must also provide information on the supplier and the buyer of the product. And they must collect sufficient information about if this product is really deforestation free and legally produced. So also based on that, the company has to um, assess the risk. Um, for that, they have to take into consideration about 14 risk categorizations. So they range from the level of risk associated in the benchmarking. The benchmarking I will explain in a minute. Then also the presence of forests in the relevant area and the potential deforestation rate around it. Also the presence of indigenous communities in the areas and potential claims, legitimate claims by um, indigenous peoples on the relevant area. Then also, um, for example, things on the general country of production, on the situation there, like for example, is there any conflict? Um, what is the level of corruption? So all things that might affect the, the credibility of documents. They also have to assess um, how complex the supply chain is. So meaning how likely is it that there is a risk of circumvention with this regulation by laundering a product through another market? Um, they also have to take into consideration so-called substantiated concerns. These are information that, um, for example, NGOs can provide to companies and EU common authorities of EU states um, with hints towards non-compliances uh, of potential companies and thereby civil society can actually contribute to law enforcement when they provide information and non-compliances to EU authorities that then oblige companies to look into this and might find for them. Then they also um, can assess uh, if a product is certified. And this is one category of like year 14 um, that is relevant for um, the risk assessment. So this means that um, there is no green line for certified products and it's always the company who is responsible for due diligence. But nevertheless, if a product is certified or not is something that a company can consider in their risk, uh, in their risk assessment. And based on that, uh, uh, like I said, the company should undertake risk mitigation measures if there is a non-negligible risk. And this can um, have like two strategies. The first is that the company might look more into um, documents or verification procedures or additional audits. So everything that, you know, would um, go in the direction of further verifying the, the compliance of the product through additional means. But this can also go in the direction of supporting producers. And this was definitely very important also for the German government because here it says that companies um, are asked to su uh, support their producers, in particular smallholders, through capacity building for them and investments in them and thereby to support them with compliance 
with the regulation. And of course, from a development perspective, I think that's very important that smallholders can enjoy this level of support also from companies. And finally, as I said, if there's now a, non -neg uh, a negligible risk, the company will um, place the product in your market by first filing this due diligence statement with the HS code, the name of the company, and the plots of lands of all, or like the geocoordinates of all plots of lands of production of this cargo that they want to bring on the EU market, and thereby the company confirms that the product is in compliance. So, and now please give me one second. Thank you very much. That was my cold. Um, I forgot one thing, as you say in the green lane in the bottom. Um, you might be familiar already with the so-called flag licenses that can be issued through a VPA process. In the future, flag licenses will not be considered as a full green line because in the future, flag licenses are considered to prove the legality of the timber, but not that the timber is deforestation and degradation free. So for this requirement on deforestation free and degradation free production, the company would still have to conduct due diligence. That's an important change compared to the EUTR with regards to timber. And with that, I would look into more the law enforcement part. So there will be already very um, specific checks on products that uh, point to a very high risk before customs. But in generally, it will be EU competent authorities that are assigned from all the individual member states that check those companies in the EU that bring a product on the EU market. So for that, they will do random checks of companies that place relevant products on the EU market. And the number of checks they undertake depends on the level of risk of the country in the benchmarking. This benchmarking I will explain later. Very importantly, there's also a so-called information system involved. This will be a digital platform where companies, customs authorities, competent authorities that are responsible for the controls and also the European Union have access. And there the companies will upload all the due diligence statements and thereby they will also upload their the geolocation coordinates of all plots of land of production that will be very efficiently and automatically uploaded in this information system. And then, of course, also through these information systems, there can be done certain, let's say, plausibility checks. Um, the fines um, can range from like um, financial um, sanctions over the confiscation of products and also profits from the sales to the temporary exclusion from public procurement and access to public funding in the EU. It can also mean a temporary prohibition to place relevant products on the EU market. And it can also mean a prohibition to use a simplified due diligence procedure. Um, I will explain that in a minute as well. But very important is that the EU common authorities will only check those companies that act as operators or traders. So these companies that place a product on the EU market or trade with a product that is already on the EU market. So there will be never ever any fines on smallholders and partner countries. There can be only fines, etc., on companies that um, have to fulfill the due diligence procedures. I think that's very important to emphasize here. And then, as I mentioned before already, um, parties with like... Um, I would say third parties with a specific interest like civil society in the future can uh, submit so-called substantiated uh, concerns to EU um, companies and also to EU um, common authorities. And then authorities are obliged to have a look at the uh, validity, robustness and credibility of these substantiated concerns. So usually it will mean that the common authority will check a company that is associated with this concern and will do additional checks with them. So this means this would actually be an avenue for um, smallholders or local communities to um, ensure that their land rights are uh, respected. That's why also, for example, the Brazilian Association of Indigenous Peoples uh, welcomes the UDR because thereby they can... Um, have an additional avenue to, to protect their land rights. 
And now I would like to explain this, um, let's say, famous benchmarking. You might have heard about this already. This is a process where the European Commission will identify the level of risk of deforestation for all countries on a national and sometimes on a subnational level. Um, and it will categorize countries in three levels of risk, low risk, standard risk or high risk. Uh, and it has mostly consequences of the controls by EU common authorities, but also a bit on due diligence. So if a company in the future sources from a area or a country that is categorized as low risk, it enjoys reduced or simplified due diligence procedures. The company still has co to collect the relevant information and documents, but it does not have to collect or do all the risk assessment. It only has to assess the risk of a circumvention of the regulation through complex supply chains. And the other criteria only have to be assessed if there are specific points towards non-compliances. And of course, that also the risk mitigation measures only have to apply if there are specific points pointing towards um, non-compliances. And in addition, these companies that source from low risk areas enjoy a reduced number of checks from EU common authorities because they will check only 1% of the companies that place a product on the EU market for the first time or that trade with the product there. If there is a standard risk categorization, the due diligence of this obligation is like I explained before. And the EU common authorities will control or check 3% of the companies. The only consequence of a high risk categorization is that EU competent authorities will check an increased number of companies. They will then check 9% of companies and also 9% of the relevant trade volume coming from these high risk areas. But there is no import ban or whatsoever because it's also very clear also in high risk countries, there still can be many low risk areas because there's simply no forest around for quite some time. So this is still a low risk area and a product can be easily imported to the European Union. So there's no import ban or something like that involved here. This benchmarking will be based on several criteria and these are differentiated into two categories. The first are like the main categories these are, um, yeah, can be based on very objective scientific evidence. This is the deforestation rate in the relevant area, also the and also the rate of forest degradation. Sorry, um, it's also the rate of the expansion of agricultural production of relevant commodities, and it's also production trends in general of the relevant commodities. And then secondary criteria that can also be assessed are, for example, the, the objectives in the nationally determined contribution, the NDC, with regarding the photo sector, so on agroforestry um, and land use and agriculture. And then secondly, also potential agreements and other instruments that are already in place or will be in place in the future between the European Union and the partner country. Also, the level of national and subnational laws uh, that are there already to, to hold deforestation. Then also the, the level of transparency of the country and production and where relevant also to what extent there are uh, laws on human rights and IPCC's rights that are also like enforced. And finally, also if there are potential sanctions of the UN Security Council of the, or of the Council of the EU. So this is about the benchmarking. And with that, I would go to uh, my maybe favorite article, Article 30, on cooperation with third countries. This is a very unique article actually in EU policy making. Um, it's the first time that such an article is included in a EU law. And it says that the European Commission and its member states shall in the future embark on more partnerships and cooperation with partner countries to jointly address deforestation and forest degradation and to jointly work towards the objectives of this regulation. It's very flexible. It says that this cooperation can reach from structured dialogues, administrative arrangements, um, provisions in existing agreements and roadmaps and development cooperation. So everything that can support partner countries with the transition to an 
agricultural production that is uh, not contributing to deforestation. It says also very clearly that it shall be based on very participatory processes, um, including civil society, indigenous groups, local communities, the private sector, and of course also smallholders. And it also emphasizes that the European Commission shall work also more in bilateral and multilateral fora towards the objectives of this regulation. So, for example, in the UNFCCC, in the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, WTO, G7 and G20 and other relevant fora. And with that, I would already come to my last slide. I already mentioned in the beginning that there will be a revision of the regulation. So in about mid-24, the Commission will assess if this regulation should be extended to not only cover forests, but to also cover so-called other wooded land. That's another FAO category. And this would then, of course, also include more ecosystems, also tree savannas, for example, like the Brazil Cerrado. So that's the first review. Then after two years, so in mid-25 in this case, the Commission will also assess if the regulation should be extended to other valuable ecosystem with particular climate and biodiversity value. Um, it will also assess if it should be uh, extended to other commodities, in particular uh, to maize. Also, if Annex 1 on the relevant products should be adapted, where all the relevant products are listed. And also, if um, this regulation should be extended in a way that also the financial sector should be obliged to conduct due diligence to ensure that they do not finance deforestation. So that's definitely a very important point. And then finally, after five years, so mid-28, the Commission will do the general review, that is the standard EU legislative procedure. And there it will do another uh, review to assess if there are uh, there's a need for additional trade facilitating tools, um, what is the impact on farmers, in particular on smallholders, if, for example, the definition of degradation should be adopted, because like this is definitely not easy to find, if the threshold for polygons should be adapted, also, if there are certain changes in trade patterns that point towards structural circumvention of the regulation, and also how effective are the checks by EU company authorities. Sorry, this is a very full slide, but it's a very complex regulation. I think that's why it's not so easy to make it more uh, shorter or more concise sometimes. So with that, I would have come to an end. I would like to share with you here a link to the legislative text of the regulation in various languages. Of course, you can also find it in Spanish. There's also the link to the so-called FAQ from the European Commission. This one was published in June 23, uh, and the revised version will be uh, shared in the new next days or weeks. Uh, it shall be actually published before Christmas. And these FAQs specify a bit the open questions around the UDR that sometimes exist. And the Commission will also publish at some point in 24, most likely in the first half of 24, a more specific guidance on the regulation that will provide more guidance on the um, terms around legality, on the role of certification and on this term of agricultural use, for example. So with that, I would say, first of all, muchas gracias. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, thank you very much to the translation and I'm looking forward to your questions. Muchísimas gracias nuevamente a Francisca Rao por esta presentación. Recuerden entonces que tenemos abierto a partir de este momento el espacio para preguntas y respuestas. Pueden colocarlas en el chat en español y nosotros iremos haciendo las traducciones correspondientes. Vamos a dar unos minutos para ver cuál sería entonces la primera pregunta que tenemos.
Okay, shall I start with answering the questions in the chat? Yes. Okay, maybe I can start with a question from Sharos Roldan, and I'm very sorry, I will certainly pronounce your names not correctly, and it might sound very funny to you, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you ask, what about collection centers where the products from hundreds or thousands of small producers are mixed, um, if they will be allowed to mix products under these new regulations? So this regulation obliges companies to know from which plots of land the relevant products come from, and the product must be compliant. But of course, the compliant products can be mixed. So at such a collection center, I guess you have to have literally a second pile where you collect all the products for, for whom you can be certain that they are deforestation free and legally produced and for whom you have the geolocation of the plots of production. But then when you know that the products are compliant, then of course you can mix them in one pile and submit a geolocation for all of them together. Of course, this is possible. Otherwise, you would need identity preserved level that's not feasible. So I hope this answers this question here. And then I'm looking further up to a question about forestry in Guatemala, where forestry systems are regulated by a forest harvesting plan and where tree species of a certain diameter are cut to irrigate the forest itself. Um, you're asking if under this regulation any intervention in the forest would be disqualified. Um, for this, maybe please let me go back a few slides to the definition of degradation. Oh, sorry, it was too quick. So here again, uh, you can find the definition of degradation. It really depends of the, on the forest that you are speaking about, about uh, which forest you want to harvest uh, timber from. Um, I assume if you do such a procedure in a normal um, secondary forest, then this would not qualify as degradation because thereby you would not convert a, a primary forest into a plantation forest or other wooded land or into a planted forest. So I would not see a problem there, to be very honest. But for that, please have a look again at this um, definition of degradation free. And then also have a look at the definitions provided by the FAO for all these terms for primary forest, for naturally regenerating forests, etc. All these questions, I think they are best placed by comparing these different definitions with each other. And now I see one question for which I do not have any translation yet. Or is that the same one? Si vamos a traer la traducción. Mm -hmm. Si alguien quiere. It's the same question. It's the same question. I'm also just realizing. Sorry. Uh, I also see a question in the normal chat by Mauricio Mendizabal. I think I understand it. So you are asking to what extent you can convert forests into an agroforestry system. Is that correct? So you can, of course, always convert a cocoa or coffee plantation into an agroforestry system, of course. And I think that's also in particular in terms of climate change, very important. But what is not allowed under this regulation is to convert a forest um, and a forest that is defined by FA, as defined by FAO would be converted into um, an agroforestry system. This you cannot do, at least not after 2020. If it has been done before 2020, it's not a problem. If it has been done after 2020, it would not be compliant with the regulation. And if you do not know about this definition of forest uh, by the FAO, it's about areas with more than half a hectare with at least 10% uh, forest cover and um, trees higher than five meter or areas that um, can reach these parameters in the future. I hope this answered this question to the best of my understanding in Spanish. So 
So Okay, I'm seeing more questions. Another question on what are the obligations of a commodity producer in order to qualify as a deforestation free commodity producer? This is a very good question. Under the regulation, there is no such thing as a deforestation free commodity producer because it must be decided for every cargo that is placed on the EU market if the shipment itself is deforestation free or not. Um, but nevertheless, in general, when you talk about the, the producer itself of the primary product, um, then you as a producer simply have to respect the categories that are here listed on this slide. So you cannot be a deforestation free producer if you have converted forest after 2020 or if you do not respect the legislation that is mentioned here. But if you have uh, like not converted any forest after 2020 and respect the law, then then you are good to go. Then you simply have to collect the geolocation for your plot of land um, and check how you can get access to a traceable supply chain. I think that might be sometimes a challenge, but then you can easily export to the EU market. Because also, you know, this traceability requirement has actually also huge benefits because now if you have a producer that has conducted no deforestation, you can easily uh, prove it by just, you know, you overlap the ge geo coordinates of the plot of land with satellite imagery. And then usually you see quite clear if deforestation has occurred or not. Of course, sometimes you need high resolution images, sometimes less granular satellite images is enough, but that gives you um, a lot of also credibility towards your bias. Um, I think I already answered a question on the agroforestry system. Ah, but the question is, uh, to, okay, sorry, I did not get it correctly, the uh, agroforestry system question. So it was about what if the agroforestry system of cocoa is converted to agroforestry system with coffee? That's not a problem because both qualify as agricultural land and, you know, the cocoa plantation already was not considered as a forest, but as a cocoa plantation. So you can easily convert it to a coffee plantation also after 2020. That's not a problem. Sorry, I do not understand it fully in Spanish. <laughs> um, so the next question is, what are the obligations of a processor of raw material products coming from a forestry or agroforestry systems? I mean, of course, the the processor always have to has to um, transfer the relevant information, in particular the geolocation requirements, to its buyers for the products um, that he or she is processing. Um, and of course, the processor should ensure already that he or she is only buying from products uh, from lots of land where no forest degradation has occurred and where no conversion of forest into agroforestry after 2020 has occurred. But you don't have like very specific obligations for you because like the obligations is on the company that puts the product on the EU market. Okay, that's already, I don't see a new question yet. And please let me know if, um, oh yeah. Another question is who are the competent authorities that will verify? So each EU member state will assign one governmental authority as the so-called competent authority. In Germany, it's the, I have to translate it now, Federal Agency for Food and Agriculture. So it's an, as, uh, an agency linked to the Federal Ministry for Food and Agriculture. Uh, this agency was already the competent authority under the EU timber regulation, and it will now also act as competent authority under the EU deforestation regulation. Uh, and every uh, member state of the 27 has to assign its own uh, competent authority. Um, There's one more question for which I still wait for translation, so that allows me to have a second. So 
So sorry for the silence. I think we're just waiting for the translation of the question of Julio Ortiz. Ortiz there it is already. Thank you very much to translation. Uh, the million dollar question. <laughs> who is going to bear or finance all the costs incurred in the risk assessment and the mapping? Um, yeah, that's maybe indeed the million dollar question. Um, it's clear that primarily um, the risk assessment and the data collection and the risk mitigation measures must be undertaken by the company that places the product on the EU market for the first time. So of course they are the primary ones that have to cover the costs because it's their obligation to do so. There's also a recital in the regulation. It's not a legally binding article, but there is a recital, uh, recital 50, um, where the regulation also calls uh, on companies that they should ensure also in the context of this regulation, um, a living income for producers. But as I said, it's a non-legally binding um, aspect of the regulation. It um, has more signal character, to be very honest. And I think there's a new question coming in, going more in the direction of certification. That's also a, a very frequent question. I might already go to the slide that deals with certification. Thank you very much for translation. It says um, if deforestation free products, if it will be a kind of certification, who will certify if a product is deforestation free? So I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding. It's not a kind of certification. It's really that the company placing the product on the EU market must fulfill its due diligence to ensure that the product is deforestation free. And maybe the company decides that to fulfill its due diligence obligations, it also builds on certification and build, uh, buys certified products. But there will never be a certification saying this product is deforestation free uh, and there will be no list of recognized certification schemes under the UDR. It's very important that um, it's, it's companies who are responsible and they cannot push away their responsibility, for example, to certification schemes that that does not exist under the UDR. It's really the company that places the product on the EU market who is, is liable and responsible. So there's no direct certification involved here. Nevertheless, on a more personal level, I think deforestation uh, certification definitely has a role to play. And I also assume that many companies, in particular the smaller ones, uh, will buy certified products to um, as part of their risk mitigation measures or uh, as part of their due diligence, that it will be definitely important. But then they will just use um, certification schemes that are out there already and that are credible. But there will be no list of certification schemes endorsed by the European Commission or something like that. I don't know if there are more questions. Uh, I see a question on the polygon, but I'm still waiting for the translation to avoid that I have a misunderstanding again. I'm very sorry, it's sometimes really hard not to speak Spanish, I must admit. Uh, thank you very much for translation. So it asks if a producer has four hectares in forest or agroforestry, but not in one piece, should he have individual polygons? Um, no, the the requirement to have polygons really only of refers to one plot of land that consists of one piece of production area that is like a com a consistent and linked area. If you have like one hectare there and then, I don't know, some roads and forests in between and then one hectare there and one hectare here, then you only have to provide um, one geo coordinate for each of your plots because then there are different plots. And this threshold applies to the plot size, not to the overall um, size of the estate of the owner. So he must then have individual plots, uh, geolocation for plots of land. And there's one more question about given the current market situation, it's difficult for the company to cover all these expenses. 
at some point there will be some support from the somehow I cannot extend the now Teams is fading me. Cannot click on see more. Uh, at some point there will be some support from the EU to be able to make all this work. Yeah, that's important point. The uh, European Union is already stepping up its support for partner countries. Um, you might have heard already that there is a so-called Team Europe initiative um, underway that shall support partner countries with um, addressing commodity different deforestation, of course, also with complying, like with creating enabling framework conditions for um, companies to comply with and also to support smallholders with, with inclusion. Um, this will be launched at uh, COP28 in Dubai, so in a few days from now, and then you would have more information on this one. I also know that there are several projects of German Development Corporation uh, in Central America, about which my colleagues here uh, are much better informed than I am, I guess. Um, so please also reach out to them in case you have questions about this. So, But there are several projects already underway in, in this regard. And I guess there's a new question about when the regulation enters into force, but I'm now guessing again. I speak French, so from that I try to translate into, based on that I try to translate to Spanish versions, but I'm feeling a bit now like a radio moderator, you know, because I have to feel like I have to fill the silence when <laughs> I cannot reply anything. Thank you very much. When does this regulation come into force? Um, exactly. Now I understood it correctly. Um, it has entered already into force formally on 29th of June uh, that you can see on the timeline here. Entrada uh, en vigor. Um, so now we are in this transition phase. Uh, it has entered into force, but now we are in the transition phase when everybody can prepare and it will ultimately apply and be like, you know, a hard regulation up from end of 24, up from 30th December of 24. So in about 13 months from now. That's you can uh, see here. Then it will apply formally and then everybody has to respect it. Um, and there's another question for which my French does not help me, but I have already translation. Thank you very much. Um, can you repeat the launch date of the project? Ah, um, yeah, this Team Europe initiative on support with the commodity driven deforestation and the UDR will be launched on 9th December in Dubai at the COP28 by the European Commission and by several EU member states, including also Germany. So it's December 9th. Where were? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know if there are more questions from, from your side. Um, I must admit it's very nice to read Spanish and I also must admit I was sometimes a bit distracted when I read my own Spanish slides but I had to speak in English. It's not that easy actually, I must admit, although I don't speak Spanish. Maybe I learned Spanish through the EUDR by just reading the, the legal text in Spanish all the time. I know it already in English by heart, so maybe now in Spanish. But if there are no more questions, thank you for stepping in. <laughs> Muy bien, entonces hemos llegado al final de las preguntas. Thank you so much, Francisca, for your time. Agradecemos también a todos y todas por sus preguntas. Y una vez más también a Francisca, del equipo de la Iniciativa de Cadenas de Valor Sostenible, por supuesto, por sus respuestas. Sabemos que estas nuevas regulaciones buscan siempre la sostenibilidad del sector agrícola y que su acatamiento será de beneficio en el mediano y también en el largo plazo. Para continuar con el diálogo, les vamos a invitar a una breve dinámica en la cual nos gustaría conocer más de los temas que a ustedes también les gustaría abordar en estas sesiones. Para ello, tenemos una dinámica que explicaremos a continuación. 
Vamos a darle entonces la palabra a María Gabriela nuevamente para que nos introduzca sobre esta dinámica y podamos participar todos y todas de ella. María Gabriela, te escuchamos. Eh, gracias, Mike. Eh, como decías, pues vamos a, a hacer una dinámica para conocer qué otros temas les gustaría que abordáramos durante estas sesiones. Para ello, eh, vamos a seguir las, las eh, siguientes indicaciones, en las cuales eh, vamos a entrar al sitio web www.menti.com e ingresaremos el siguiente código, 3442-8457. O, para hacerlo mucho más sencillo, pueden hacerlo escaneando el código QR. La información también va a estar en, en, disponible en unos momentos en el chat para que también puedan copiar el link y puedan eh, ingresar el código. En, repito nuevamente, www.menti.com. Y para el código es el 34428457. O, si es de su preferencia, también puede escanear el código QR. Vamos a dar unos minutos para que eh, las personas puedan ir eh, ingresando y una vez eh, haya respuestas enviadas, las vamos a ir viendo a continuación. Ya tenemos a una primera respuesta, ampliar el tema de la cooperación para este tema. Les agradecemos que ahí vayan enviando sus respuestas y que ya que todas estas respuestas se, serán tomadas en consideración para, para próximos webinars. Vamos a dar dos minutos más para que las personas puedan ir enviando sus respuestas. Expertos de otros países sobre el abordaje de la legislación, cómo lo están afrontando, oportunidades de asistencia técnica, cómo se puede trabajar como industria en origen y destino para abordar la eudeforestación, cuál es la postura de otros países. En cuanto al sector cafetalero, quisiéramos conocer cuál será la postura de Anacafé y del MAGA, entre otras. Pueden seguir enviando sus respuestas. Vamos a dar un minuto más y concluimos. Hasta el momento tenemos eh, 17 eh, respuestas. Muchas gracias a todos por sus valiosos aportes. Bueno, ya vamos que ahí va subiendo a 18. Como les decía, estas respuestas serán recopiladas y tomadas en consideración para la realización de próximos webinars. En este momento extendemos la palabra nuevamente al señor Michael para que pueda hacer la despedida y agradecimiento de esta actividad. Muchas gracias y adelante. Muchísimas gracias, María Gabriela, y gracias también, por supuesto, a todos y a todas por sus valiosos aportes. Estas respuestas van a ser recopiladas y posteriormente tomadas en consideración para la realización de nuestros próximos webinars y también espacios de diálogo como este que acabamos de tener junto a Francisca Rao, que nuevamente le agradecemos por su tiempo. Eh, le agradecemos a todos y todas también por su presencia y su participación en este evento que hemos denominado Espacio de Preguntas y Respuestas para el Reglamento de la Unión Europea sobre Productos Libres de Deforestación. Este fue un espacio pensado para que el sector agrícola se prepare para la debida diligencia Reglamento de la Unión Europea. Muchísimas gracias a todos y todas y que tengan muy buenas tardes.